Welcome to the Shelter from the Storm podcast, a daily walk through the Bible with me, Pastor Jason Poling, as we seek shelter in Jesus Christ from the storms of this life. It's a great day to glorify God. This is Pastor Jason Poling coming to you from the Shelter from the Storm podcast, a daily brief dive into God's Word. And we are in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 11. I'm in the New American Standard Translation. And what we're doing here now in Mark 11 is we're starting to take a turn towards the end. This is the beginning of the end in the Gospel, the beginning of the end of the mission of Jesus, which he had ultimately come to do, which is to come to Jerusalem, to die on a cross for the forgiveness of the sins of those who would believe in him to rise again the third day and to ascend into heaven at the right hand of the Father, to complete his mission. And of course, up until this time, if you've been following the podcast and going through us, going through with us, Mark 1 through 10, we see Jesus revealing more of who he is, his uh, nature and identity to the people and to his disciples, and then slowly but surely teaching his disciples what it means to follow him, what it means to be about the, the kingdom of God business. In Mark 11, Verse 1, though, we see this march to Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you'll find a, find a colt tied there, on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? You say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it back here. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. So just kind of an odd uh, lead up to the story uh, where where Jesus, of course, um, uh, sort of the Palm Sunday experience is what's going on. Um, Can you imagine walking out out of your door and your vehicle, your car is being broken into by two guys who are trying to hotwire it and take it? Uh, of course, you would rightly ask, you know, what on earth do you think you're doing? You're stealing my car. And the fact that they just say the Lord has need of it. Uh, the Lord wants this. And immediately they they give them permission to steal their car, to steal their colt. Um, obviously, it could be a supernatural intervention here that God just uh, causes these men to do that. But it also may just refer back to the fact that Jesus is enormously well-known and popular amongst the people. Uh, the Lord, as they would, you know, they would call him. He's the, 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 the they, they would have seen him maybe as a political military king come to overthrow Rome, but definitely an authoritative teacher and a miracle worker. So he just had enormous clout and publicity. And of course, this is why, as we see in verse eight, we see the people excited about uh, his approach to Jerusalem. And these people, you've probably seen pictures of, of uh, artist renditions of the Palm Sunday with all the people spreading their garments on the road and holding out leafy branches, as it says in verse 8, which they had cut from the fields. And of course, what's going on there, interestingly, there may be a tie back in verse 8 with the garments on the road to a, um, a little lesser known king named King Jehu, who was one of the kings of the northern tribes of, of Israel. So when um, the nation split after Solomon, you had the two tribes in the south, uh, Judah, and then you had the ten tribes to the north called Israel, and they had a, they had a ton of terribly wicked kings. Jehu was, I think, the only king who actually was somewhat decent, and God uh, appointed him to be king. And because of his uh, character, and and it wasn't perfect, but there were some things that he did for God that were godly. Uh, he had, I think, five generations of of a dynasty, which was the longest, I think, in Israel's history, um, the northern tribe's history. But Jehu, um, when he was appointed as king, the people did that as well. And uh, I believe it was 2 Kings 9, they put their garments down. So it could be hearkening back to that, because what Jehu ultimately did, and he was called by God to wipe out the evil of King Ahab and Jezebel. And one of the things that Jehu did, which is kind of shocking, but he basically tricked all the priests of the false god Baal, who was, uh, they were leading the Israelites away from Yahweh, from God. Uh, he tricked them into coming to a place of worship, and then he he basically killed them all. And so there could be some, um, in the Holy Spirit's sovereign um, writing of the Scripture and putting all these pieces together, which is what I found fascinating about Scripture, it could be that there's a reference here to Jesus being 
uh, like a, a Jehu, not of course in the character of Jehu, because char- Jehu is definitely an imperfect man, but in the fact that he's coming into Jerusalem to bust up the system, which is what he does here at the end of our text today. In verse 11, he sees the temple, and then the next day, we'll see tomorrow or in the next podcast, he turns over the tables. He is ticked at these priests because they've led the people astray. And so it's kind of like Jehu coming in and, uh, you know what, kicking you know what and taking names. And he is uh, going to bring about um, a revival, a restoration, a reformation uh, through his mission. So that could be what's going on with the cloaks. Of course, the the leafy branches that harkens back to Leviticus 23 and other passages that speak of the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as Sukkot. And this is where they were commanded by God to build these like booths, these temp, these uh, uh, tents, and people would usually out of like sticks and branches, and they would stay in those for seven days as a reminder of their journey out of the slavery of Egypt. And it's a way for them to, it was, it was a way for them to celebrate uh, the salvation they had in God. So that's also interesting. Jesus is coming as the Savior, as the salvation to rescue them from the Egyptian bondage, if you will. Um, they might have thought under Rome, but Jesus, of course, is teaching under the tyranny of sin and Satan and death. And so they're uh, with their leafy branches kind of saying, we are celebrating the coming of the Savior. And those who went before in verse nine and those who followed after were crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is another reference to his saving uh, power and to his lordship and kingship. Uh, Hosanna originally was a term that meant save, it began to be more of a term of just blessing that you would speak over. So that God save the queen, right? It's that kind of Hosanna, blessed are you. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That comes out of a psalm, Psalm 118. So again, the people or the Holy Spirit inspiring the people to see larger connections and themes. They would have seen him as this saving king uh, come into Jerusalem to uh, deliver the people. So, which is exactly what he came to do, just in a different way than what people fully expected. But in verse 10, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna is the, in the highest. And again, Psalm 118 is a victory psalm, right? About this king uh, who's going to bring peace uh, by restoring the nation. And that's really what's happening with Jesus riding the, the, the donkey or the colt of a donkey. Uh, when a, uh, a leader would come into a city on a, on a, on a horse, on a war steed, that was definitely a sign of uh, it's a time of war. But when they would come in on a colt, on a donkey, it was a sign that they are this king is bringing peace. And in fact, in Zechariah 9, you can look at that where it talks about this prophecy of the Savior to come, the Messiah would ride on the colt because of this bringing of peace. And I'm giving you a lot here from the Old Testament narrative, which is so amazing, all the um, the biblical theological themes that tie together. Just amazing. In fact, even Mark 11, 1, the, the fact that they're near the Mount of Olives, Olives, the mentioning of the Mount of Olives has a lot of prophetic import as well, as you see in Zechariah 14, where the Savior, the Messiah, God, he puts his feet uh, on two different mounts. One is Mount of Olives, and and it's it's this beautiful um, a prophecy of this Savior bringing in all the peoples. Gentile and Jew together who are going to be saved and they're to come into Zion, the city of David, the city of God, Jerusalem. And so all this is just pregnant with power and you know prophetic import. And so you can't miss what's going on here. It's it, everyone would have been like, this is the king, the savior. And again, they might have thought physical king only. And that is what he is ultimately, but he's more than that. He's the eternal king to save us forever from our enemies, sin, Satan, death. So um, verse 11, he entered Jerusalem. So there he is. The king has come into the city, the holy city, and he goes into the temple, the place of God, the place where God and man meet, which now will become Jesus, of course. Jesus will become the new temple in his body, and he will be the place now where we are reconciled to the Father. But he's coming into a temple that has been desecrated by the false teaching of the priests, the misleading um, 
uh, doctrines that they had. And so after he looks around at the temple, he departs for Bethany with the 12 since it was already late. So he's looking around and what we're to anticipate. And as we see in the next text, um, he is looking around in, in judgment uh, upon the priests, upon the system, and with passion for his people to deliver them from all of that, uh, you know, slavery and, and uh, the slavery to falsehood. And he's going to bring them out of Egypt into the promised land through his sacrifice on the cross. All right, guys, love you. We will uh, catch you on the next podcast. Take care. Thanks for taking a few minutes with me to dive into God's word. I always appreciate your feedback and look forward to your questions. You can email those to me at jason at cornerstoneyc.com. You can also check out my videos and other content on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and now twitch.tv slash pastor jpo. Definitely check out also the content from the church I serve, Cornerstone Church of Yuba City in California. And please share this podcast with others. I'll catch you on the next podcast as we learn how to shelter from the storms of this life in Jesus Christ. Thank you.